12 o'clock on my end. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everybody to today's Talks on Tuesday webinar. This is our first webinar of 2019, so Happy New Year. Um, my name is Dana Childress. I work for the Partnership for People with Disabilities at Virginia Commonwealth University as part of the Integrated Training Collaborative. And I'll be the host today. Um, I'm going to introduce our presenter in just a moment. I want to also put a shout out to Jeannie Schroeder who is on the line with us. Jeannie just typed the number in chat for me. Jeannie is our technology specialist and so she does all the work with our registration, all the back end coordinating and technology and has done a beautiful job designing our slide deck today. So big thumbs up and thank you to Jeannie. Um, so today our topic as you can see on screen is refresh your palate. We're going to talk about cleft lip and palate care. This is part one of a two part series. When you registered today, you were automatically registered for part, one, part two, which is nice so you don't have to re-register. Um, part one, we're really going to provide you with an overview of cleft lip and cleft palate care. Um, we're going to talk about um, statistics, lots of information. We'll talk about the anatomy. Our presenter is going to share the anatomy, um, kind of looking at from a structure and function point of view to try to increase your comfort level and your knowledge level about cleft lip and cleft palate. She's going to share with you causes, associated risk factors, and just start to touch on the importance of early management, both developmental, which is more on the end of early intervention, and um, medical management. We're just going to touch on those though. This, the first part is really that overview. The second part will focus more on interventions and the impact of cleft lip and cleft palate on feeding and speech development. Our presenter will also talk to you about and emphasize the importance of team care and how important it is to have a team around this family and um, the child to, for them to have successful outcomes. So that's what we'll talk about this time and next time. Um, you, I want to make sure you know if you didn't join our orientation that your chat box in your lower left hand corner is your way to communicate with us. So feel free to type into chat as you can see folks have done any questions, comments you have. We'll be monitoring chat as we go along. Um, that's a place for you to, to put some ideas out there. If we miss your idea or your comment or your question, I'll be watching the chat as, as well as the presenter and we will go back to any questions we miss. Let's see, I think that's it. Oh, I did want to go ahead and give you, make sure you have it on your calendar. The date for part two is March 5th and at the end of the webinar I'll have a little bit more information too. So I think that's it. I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to our presenter. Our presenter today is Colette Reynolds. She's a speech language pathologist um, and Colette we, we're, is unique I think because she has experience to share from you, for you um, with the perspective of being an early interventionist but also from the perspective of having worked on a cleft palate team through the hospital for years. So I'm going to turn this over to Colette for her to introduce herself more fully and I want to tell you Colette thank you so much for working with us. You've got great information to share today so thank you. Thank you, Dana and Jeannie, very, very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Colette Reynolds. Um, thanks for joining in today to find out more about cleft lip and cleft palate. Uh, as, as Dana said, I, I am a speech and language pathologist. I have a private practice in Warrenton, Virginia. So I see some neighbors uh, on the line, and uh, I'm also an EI provider for the Rappahannock Rapidan ITC program. And I'm a member of the craniofacial cleft palate team at the Inova Children's Hospital, and that's in um, uh, Northern Virginia, uh, in the Fairfax Falls Church area. So, uh, for some of you, this might be a refresher, and for others, you might be um, uh, putting yourself out there uh, and learning something brand new, and that's wonderful. We're here to learn and to share, and. Um, Give me a, sad, a smile every once in a while in that chat so I look for it and so that I remember to breathe. Um, and here, here we go. Uh, Dana also told us uh, some of the um, objectives for today. I'm hoping to really increase your comfort level uh, with knowing what cleft lip and palate is, um, what it looks like. Um, you'll be more familiar with some structural landmarks and that means some anatomy just so you understand the function of the palate and um, when that palatal function is disrupted and how we get it back um, because the palate is critical. It has a critical role in feeding and in our speech. 
uh, production. And uh, we can also reflect why EI is and should be part of team care. We're the community team, and um, there are other teams that are caring for these kids. And there is one type of team is called the pallet team. And that care goes on beyond uh, when, beyond age three, when these kids leave our very caring um, hands. Um, so um, I'd, I'd like for us to have a better connection uh, from the community to that um, other team. Uh, so my introduction to class with Impala began very early as a, a young therapist. I, I wasn't working my pointer. I should have put in too many years in EI to remember. Um, so I started very young and I've been learning uh, all along and loving working with these kids. So how about you? Um, here's our first poll. Have you worked with kids, uh, with children, who have slept with palate? And Dana, if you want to chime in with a poll to remind yep, us. Absolutely. So the way you're going to access your poll, you'll answer this question by looking to the left of your slide in your participant box where you see your name. Below your name, you will see four small boxes. The box that's the furthest to the right has a lowercase a in it. Hover on that A or click on that lowercase A and you will see your, your drop down menu that gives you the A, B, C, D options. So click your option um, and that's one way you can let us know. If, if you want, you also have the option like Goochland, Powhatan, and Nicole have done to type your letter in the chat. Um, so either way is okay. Um, and once we have your answers, we will publish the poll and be able to see, at least for those of you that use the poll option um, the, in your participant box, we'll be able to see how that worked out. So it looks like we have Kathy, a couple other people then um, putting their answers in chat, and that's fine. Um, we'll give you another couple seconds. Okay, and we have this answers, Jeannie. I guess we could go ahead and pu publish the poll. And if you'd like to put into chat too, um, if it was C or D, where what was your setting when you worked with these kids? And I'll try to catch up with that. Alrighty. So looks like um, oh okay. So we have a combination of people who um, have direct, um, most of us have uh, direct contact and knowledge about uh, the uh, kids with the palate, which is wonderful. Um, and a few who um, have not yet embarked on that journey. Um, and people have worked in Head Start, in hospitals, in um, elementary, programs in private practice. Laura was in private practice, uh, Casey in elementary schools. Okay, thanks for sharing that information. I'm sorry, that's my pointer uh, roaming around the slides. Um, so let me um, now do a little bit more uh, crowdsourcing with you um, and type into chat um, some ideas um, um, that you, things that you know about stuff with Empowered that you want to share uh, with each other or that you think is important. And uh, for, for those of you who don't have that direct um, contact, that's okay. You may have seen a documentary about that. You may have seen ads for um, organizations that promote their less of talent. So put in a few of your comments in the chat um, to share your information with, um, with a your knowledge about stuff and palette. Something that comes to mind. Um says it can affect speech, it affects speech, absolutely. Or something you're not sure about, but you could put into. So let's call that like we have folks that are typing in, which is great. Okay. Here they come. Here they come. Okay. I'm, I'm looking at that. That means I'm looking at that. <laughs> I'm remembering the set. Um, so there are different degrees of clefting. Definitely, Kathy said that. Um, uh, it affects breastfeeding. Um, there are some syndromes. Wow, you guys um, are um, at almost at, uh, probably experts here. It needs to be repaired, absolutely. Uh, Lynn's commenting about um, uh, parents' emotions that are connected with this. 
Uh, Jill has heard about Operation Smile. Okay, wonderful. Um, so a, a cleft, um, we'll talk a little bit about what a cleft is. A cleft is um, a gap, it's a split, it's an uh, opening uh, when one or both sides of the lip or the roof of the mouth don't form or fuse together. And that fusion comes uh, at midline, and sometimes the, the fusion is um, partial uh, or um, completely, um, it, it can be partially fused, I guess is what I want to say, or it uh, doesn't come together at all. This is a congenital defect. Um, it's, uh, it's not a birth injury. This occurs, this disruption in that fusion, in the growth, the formation and fusion occurs in the embryonic development um, stages. So that is somewhat of an uh, explanation, definition of stuff within palate. But did you know that, and some of you did, say that there are variations in clefting. And so clefts can occur alone, and there's my, there's my point here. Cleft lip can occur alone without the cleft palate, which is the inside part of the, the mouth, um, the roof of the mouth. We can have cleft palate alone, the inside of the mouth, the roof of the mouth, can be involved without the cleft lip, or we can have the combination of a cleft lip and a cleft palate. So the lip is involved and the roof of the mouth, some, uh, some, are, some part or all of either the lip or um, the palate. Oh, steady hands. And the reason for the, the variation um, or degrees of clefting is all linked to the way the lip and the palate are formed and, and that they form separately, individually, apart from one from the other. Um, and this, this is a series of pictures that shows the embry, uh, embryology, the development, and I'll show you two segments. And, and remember that two segments, you'll be hearing me reference it a lot. This segment is the lip, primitive lip. This segment here is the primitive what will be the palate, uh, the roof of the mouth. So um, the lip forms apart from what the palate is forming, and the movement towards midline uh, operates on a different timeline for the lip than it does for the palate. Over here in B, you can see that we have more um, closure coming to midline segments on each side of the lip. Um, this lip will form and, and complete the fusion before the, the rest of the palate does. You can see that the palate is starting to make its closure here at the top a little bit sooner than at the bottom. Uh, and that's the way it does it. Um, the closure is from the top towards the back. And in C, you'll see that we have complete fusion of the lip segment, and here's the midline that how the cells have, uh, have formed completely. And that all happens in the first trimester. By week 12, this complete fusion has occurred. And so that's the timeline and some um, information about the, the, the development of those two segments, uh, the lip and the palate, and, and they're on different um, timelines. Here are some examples of what clefting can look like with those variations. Uh, I'll get my pointer back, I hope, yep. Here, um, well, look, at, look in the center. This is an intact lip. Um, we don't know what the palate inside looks like, right? Um, we, we don't know that because we can't see it. Uh, we have to look inside and examine to know um, if there's cleft or not. Um, this is the baby with cleft lip. Now we don't know again, is there a cleft palate with that or is the palate intact? Um, this is a uni what we call um, a unilateral left cleft lip because this is on the, the child's left side. Um, we can have one side 
of lip involvement or both sides of the lip involvement, and not necessarily symmetrical involvement. So one side could be completely uh, cut, the other side might be partial, just uh, just a little bit, um, so they don't have to be equal. And for your uh, information, clefting um, is more prevalent of the cleft lip on the left side than it is on the right side. Um, and it is uh, more often complete rather than incomplete um, when it's a unilateral cleft. On the bottom, you can look with me. This is cleft at the inside of the mouth, the roof of the mouth shows that opening. And you're really looking into up into the, the nose area here. This is both the hard and the soft palate involvement. And on the right, it's that quick um, combination of lip and palate involvement. <clears throat> okay, just checking, I don't think I see any questions there. Um, you'll also see this distinction um, in the description of the variation uh, of the possible uh, ways that you can have a cleft lip and palate. In the ICD-10 code, there's a Q code section from 35 to 37. So um, you'll see that distinction cleft palate only, um, and then what part of that cleft is involved. Cleft lip only, do we have bilateral both sides or unilateral one side? The Q codes don't distinguish between complete or an incomplete lip. And then you have the combination of the 37, 237, and I've just put a couple of the point numeric um, codes uh, that would go with the, the combined combination. So you may, um, may be uh, having to look up a code. You'll read the description and hopefully you will have an idea of what that looks like and, and what those um, descriptions mean or you may have to assign a code um, if you are doing a billing for one of your procedures or, or an intake manager who's uh, getting down to early uh, information about, uh, about the, the child's medical history. <clears throat> okay, so let's um, check your knowledge again. Um, we'll do another poll. Let's answer this true or false. With, with or without cleft palate, remember it can be alone or, or with, uh, is one of the most common birth defects seen in newborn. What do you think? And you okay. could yeah. this, to answer this one, you're going to use your pointer tool. So to find your pointer tool, it looks like somebody drops their, their little um, check mark in true. You're going to look to the left of your slide. There's a vertical toolbar right up against that participant box. The second um, box in the vertical toolbar from the top might have a starburst or another icon in it. Click on that icon and then move your cursor over to click again and you'll be able to drop that symbol, that little icon, on either true or false depending on um, how you'd like to answer. If you have any trouble with the pointer tool, you can always answer in chat as well, but it looks like you guys have got the hang of it. And, um, and you ha also have the right answer because uh, cleft and palate occurs in 1 in 700 um, one in 700 births. Um, so that is the statistic on that. And I'm going to switch off of this page here and uh, take a look at this slide um, dealing with a, some stats. Uh, across the United States, and there um, are approximately a little over 7,000 cases of testing in the United States well, in 2017. And now let's come home to Virginia. We may have some other states um, visiting with us, but in Virginia there are 120 cases, about 120 cases a year that have cleft lip and palate, um, uh, baby form of cleft lip and palate. So now let's think EI in Virginia. How many referrals do you think were made in Virginia um, uh, to the EI program based on a diagnosis of, of cleft? last year in 2018. And you could put that number in chat. The uh, Stanton uh, says 40. Chris says, I hope 120. Here are 60, 60, 50, 
Eric Cummins and Kathy hopeful of 100%. And, um, okay, and uh, Gil, I see you at 30. Okay, so uh, drum roll, and the answer is 66. Last year, in 2018, um, two months ago, 66 referrals came into um, the Virginia EI program. Um, or uh, for cases of but over the five year uh, the five year average past five years uh, was that number was 70. So we'll have to think about that and what can be done because I, I see some hope in some of your answers. I hope there was 120. So uh, maybe we have a little work to do here. Um, so again, staying with EI and we know that we've had 66 cases in Virginia. Um, what do you think about this? Uh, is a child born with stress uh, and your um, is that child automatically eligible for EI services? And um, true, false, or you're not sure. I know we have a lot of veterans of EI and experienced people. So you are all, um, we have an honest answer. <laughs> not Sure, and that's great. So the answer to this question is, um, it is true. Kids born with um, stress and palate are automatically eligible, and you knew that because um, there that criterion that says a diagnosed there are diagnosed conditions that give automatic eligibility. Stress and palate um, is one of those conditions. And if you didn't know that, take a look at that list of conditions to see what other conditions might be on that. You know, we're all in different stages and stages of our information. Um, um, uh, 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 I'm sorry, I just looked at that. I, Mary Lou, I don't know the answer to that. Those were, um, we'll have to find out the answer to that. Somebody can help me out with that after the a webinar about where they refer to children who enter the services. Right. Um, so uh, kids with lip and palate have, uh, uh, and any kids with these diagnosed conditions carry higher uh, prevalence or probability of having some level of, of need or developmental delay. So just what do you think those risk factors are for the kids who have left lip and palate? Um, and uh, you can put those the answers here, those answers in chat if you would. Um, let you switch here and start typing. Okay, here we come. So we're seeing. Uh, Concerns for poor weight gain, right? That would be eating difficulties, uh, nutrition, and speed. So that was thanks to Jasmine and Chris and, and Kathy for, for um, uh, answering there. Uh, we have some branching off into some social concerns and emotional well being, um, <clears throat> uh, infections, too. Um, that, May occur. Oh, dentition. Great, Laura. Um, so keep typing, and I'm going to switch and keep looking at your answers unless you know how well that you can check off um, all of these areas of concern. Uh, um, the Stanton area knows that uh, dental issues are of concern, especially for the involvement of the left lip because that question can go through the alveolar ridge, which is you know, our upper thumb, which houses our teeth. It's the bone that houses our teeth. So uh, eruption of uh, teeth, misalignment, uh, all that going on. Emotional health and well-being was mentioned both for the family and for the child. A little bit later on for the child, um, when some social peer interactions come into to phase, and that would be, you know, especially after that three-year uh, age. Uh, so wait. Middle ear function, if I missed that, let's not forget the ears. 
those um, muscles that affect the palate, affect the eustachian tube, um, which leads to potential for hearing loss, um, unable and respiratory issues can be of concern, potential for learning difficulty, if indeed we have some middle ear or hearing difficulties, um, and our kids can just have any other uh, adult mental need, like any other child might encounter, can have medical conditions, heart conditions, prematurity that um, are more morbid or co occurring and complicate their developmental pictures. And, and someone mentioned earlier there are syndromes. Yes, indeed, there are many, many, many syndromes that can have stuff associated with it. Uh, I hope I answered um, your comment. Uh, you can ask me questions later or draw my attention if I need to. So since I mentioned syndromes, um, use your uh, drawing tool here. Uh, you can check off as many of the syndromes as you are familiar with. Um, okay, and, guys. I see some of you starting to put your pointer on. Just know that you can only drop one pointer. So if you're familiar with more than one of these syndromes, you're going to use your drawing tool, which is the tool that's just below that pointer icon in the vertical toolbar. Click on that, and you'll be able to draw a mark like we see folks are drawing in the Down syndrome box or the Pierre Robin sequence. So you can draw as many of those little marks if you're familiar with multiple syndromes. So we'll just pause and let you, let you um, get your marks on the screen. In the meantime, Colette, we do have a question that's popped up in the chat that says, how common is a cleft if a parent has a, has a cleft? The, um, there is, you know, I'm going to have to try to blank on the exact number, but that's our the question for uh, my lifeline. I wish I had a geneticist on the line. And um, there is an increased incidence if, one, if a parent um, has clefting or um, a close relative even has testing. And I could get back to that you with a direct answer for that, but there is increased risk. risk and I, I, I've missed who, who answered that question. Um, but that's a I good point. I got it, Colette. That was Stanton Waynesboro. So it sounds like there is an association if, if a parent or a close relative has it might be more common. Sure. It, that's correct. So, okay, everybody, lots of, you have lots of experience. Well, I'm, okay, we know we have Down syndrome. Um, we know about Chard syndrome. Super, I'm not going to go there and explain that. Um, I'm so happy to know that people know about velocardiofacial syndrome. It's often called BCF. Um, that has lots of developmental um, uh, concerns with it and can have, it's not necessarily an overt cleft but can also have um, a dysfunction of that palatal mechanism, um, causing difficulty with feeding uh, uh, and feet. There's a heart uh, issue with this uh, syndrome as well, and there's rising awareness for BCF. The aeroban sequence, too, uh, is linked with Stickler syndrome, and we know that the aeroban has a small jaw growth. Uh, the obstructive tongue and the cleft palate. Vanderwood is a um, probably one of the most uh, frequent causes, isolated causes of clefting. Vanderwood is linked, and the characteristic element there is the lip tip, um, which are indentations on the lower lip or lip mounds. Um, and I'm familiar with water dog, but um, that. Is has pressing and also has some limb anomalies, some club, club, um, club foot development, small stature, uh, and genetically linked as well. And I've worked with um, physical therapists, uh, co treating or co managing um, these cases in EI, and you know, taking turns what was the most the primary uh, concern um, at the time. So we needed to get um, him moving. Um, and walking as well. So, plus, uh, information on CLEF is not just for speech therapists. Um, but do know that the majority of CLEF 
um, are considered isolated without other birth defects. So 70% of the children with stress and palate will be, uh, have unassociated uh, issues or not associated with syndrome. However, the cleft palate only situation condition will um, have increased um, uh, incidence of association with, with, with syndrome. And we'll have to watch that. So I'll just take a breather and uh, catch up if we will. Um, take a sip of water. And if there are any other questions that you have, um, keep putting them in the chat, and um, maybe we'll get to some of them, uh, hopefully, in this next segment uh, coming up. All right. Um, here we go. All righty. Um, this is the refresher part for everybody. And I think I have a lot of veterans here. But we'll go through, um, because when other people might not have as much as you do, um, so you can help out here as needed. We'll review um, uh, a little bit of anatomy, and so we'll try to make it personal um, and practical. And take it from the perspective of your own palate. Look at these two slides, these two pictures. Um, familiar views, looking at a prominent nose and a lip. I'm going to call it the primary palate. And then on, and what you don't see is the dense part behind this lip. That's where your teeth are. But that's important to um, the, the development of the lip. The secondary palette now, um, um, the, the picture on the right, uh, you're familiar with the two two when you open the mirror and say ah. Um, so let's, I'm going to throw um, uh, a little quiz at you uh, here and see if you can use your points of Line off the side, connect um, the ABC with the labels below. Use your Yeah, so here you guys got the hang of it. You're going to use that drawing tool again to try to connect the dots, like Colette said, between the ABCs and the names below. Good. People are getting the hang of it. Okay. I think, I think I'm seeing. Uh, Lots going on there, and you guys are great. You get an A plus. The correct answer would be um, across the bottom A B C, hard soft uvula A B C. Um, you guys are good. And now take a look at this view, a little bit different view, but I'm going to get my pointer. If it's, it's moving, yes, I hope. Um, so I, I want you to see here the, the two segments again. I find the red dots. I'm on the segment upwards to the top of the page is the area that involves the, the formation of the lip. Um, and you'll see it goes through the dental arch, the bone that holds our teeth, and then the lip. Okay? And that's the way the closure uh, fusion occurs too, from this inside out to the lip. And that's why you can have maybe just a little involvement of the, the lip if there's a, um, a cleft uh, at the very end of that developmental stage. Go back uh, to the red dot, and we're going to move down the, to the bottom of the page. So um, we're going to take the palate tour here. I want you to take the tip of your tongue, put it behind your teeth, go up that little hill, that, that bumpy hill. Uh, and now we're at the red dot area. And curl the tip of your tongue down midline. And down midline is the bony prominence, the bony ridge. That's your hard palate. If you go right off of there or left, you are on your palatal cells. Also bone. Um, this is the hard, this the whole area is the hard palate. And that formation was complete um, at about eight weeks gestation. Now take your tongue tip back on midline, curl back a little, and feel the soft spot. You're not at the back of your throat yet. That's your soft palate. You're on your soft palate. It's soft because it's made up of muscles. Okay? These muscles connect from one side across midline to the other to make a muscular sling for action for movement. Um, 
if soft palate continues to form, come closer uh, to midline as it moves towards the back here by 10 weeks and by 12 weeks, this is completely fused when the uvula comes, um, that muscular section of the very end of the soft palate is fused. So that is your anatomy lesson 101. And I think we all survived this, including me. All right, so what does the palate do? The palate purpose is to, is my pointer, is to separate the mouth. This is the mouth, this is the tongue. I'm sure you're wondering. This is the tongue. So here's the mouth and the nose. And the palate separates the nose from the, from the mouth. We've talked about the palate as the roof of the mouth. Remember, it is also the floor of your nose. Okay. And its purpose is to separate the air, um, direct the air into the mouth, or direct the air into the nose when needed. The air can be completely uh, contained within the mouth when the soft palate makes the final closure. The soft palate uh, will contract the muscle. It will elevate, move backwards towards the back of the throat make contact here. This is like a, uh, it's a port, a window, it's a floor trap door. It moves closed, it seals off this area uh, into the nose. And why it says CP, um, another word for uh, soft palate is sebum. So that's the V, and another word for the throat we know is pharynx. So it's a velopharyngeal closure. To separate that air for feeding and feet. Um, and so you may say, well, I don't feel that closure, and no, we can't feel that closure. So, when exactly is all this action taking place, uh, this work out in the back of my, my throat, uh, on the roof of my mouth? Um, so, got my pointer again. The slide on the right shows that VP closure here, and I moved my, my arrow to be over here a little bit. So you see the soft palate is in contact with the back of the throat. No air is going to come up and able to get into the nose. It is all being directed to the mouth. And that, that's the air, we speak on air that we breathe out, that we exhale. The speech pathologists know that. Um, so all the air um, for speaking, we need to direct it into our mouth so we can make all our consonants, the P, C, C's, S's, S, H sounds, uh, and say words like puppy and baby and big baby boy and 60, 60, 60, or make your uh, quiet sound, see the stars. All of those consonants are, are routed. Um, they are, you use the air that's contained in the mouth uh, and released when we articulate these sounds. Come over to the screen. There are some consonants that do not, uh, that do require that the air goes into the nose, but there are only three of those: the M, the N, and the NG. Um, um, the M, the N, and the NG sound. Those are the nasal consonants. We need to have the air coming up, resonating and vibrating in the nose to. Sound. When you say mommy, just children's early words, no, 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 no more. Okay, so um, if you want to see this action, um, uh, this part in action, and I hope I said that that's the VLO, that's the VP port uh, action here. If you want to see that port in action, you can um, check out the link that's in the handout. To um, Dr. Chang, he's an ENT. He has an animation that, that shows this DP motion during speech, and there's also an MRI study if you, if you like that kind of technology um, uh, and detail. Uh, it's an MRI study of a speech during speech production. So let's take just a little break. Not a don't go anywhere. Um, a brief for your. Um, Screens if you have one, and take a sip because I want you to know that the CP port also works when we are uh, drinking and eating, so when we're feeding. 
and uh, take take a few sips. If you have a straw in your cup, take a few sucks on that straw. That's how you're going to suck, swallow, and breathe. Um, and yes, I just say M N N N G. Need air into the nose. Um, so back to the, the drinking. Um, we suck, swallow, breathe. And so what do you think happened? Did your port stay open or did your port close when you were making that sucking sip and, and swallow action? And, and here's a, a hint. Did any liquid go into your nose when you did that? Well, I hope not um, because that, um, I'll give you the answer here. The port should be closed when you are sucking, uh, taking that sip and Swallowing, just like the baby who needs to suck from the breast or the bottle to to create that flow. Suck, uh, we need negative pressure uh, for suction to pull that liquid um, into the mouth. And in order to do that, we need an intact palate um, that is long enough, that moves enough, that closes to create that negative um, pressure. For suction. Okay. And you're right. Good. Lynn, I'm glad that your, your VP port is working for you. All right. <laughs> we'll, move, oops, we'll move on. I think you can skip in. Okay. So just to bring that point home again and to repeat, um, this little boy is his nose closed, and we don't need to do that when we're talking. We don't need to do that when we are um, eating um, because that port, that VP port, does the work for us already. Um, that's something um, in my notes. But anyway, and this, this will show you that action for where the M and the, uh, the N sound, the air has to go into your nose. So try this with me. Remember I said we can't, we really don't feel that motion. And we don't see it because we can't look into someone's mouth the whole time they're talking. But we can hear that the support is working based on the sounds that we're producing. Um, so I'm going to make the M sound and prolong it mm, like that. And then I am going to squeeze my nose. And you can try this too. Do it out loud. Um, Okay, ready? We're going to make the M sound. Mm -hmm. And then there is no sound. There was no sound when I was squeezing my nose. I pinched my nose closed. So that meant I was disrupting the air that needed to come out of my nose, the air that needed to make that M sound. Um, my, pat, my VP port opened like it should have, directed the air to the nose to make that M sound. You can see the same thing um, happening, um, or listen for the same thing. I'm going to make the B sound and repeat the syllable. Ba 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 ba. What I did there in that um, repetition, I pinched my nose closed three different times. So what I'm hoping you heard was that there was no interruption in that sound. You heard the B continuing um, to be produced because. My port closed for me, pushed the air into my mouth. There wasn't any air in my nose, so I wasn't messing with, with the airflow. So again, the purpose of the palate is to direct airflow into the nose or the mouth um, at the right time, and the right time for, is for speech and for, um, for swallowing, um, and to protect that swallow so nothing goes uh, up in, into the nose, into the nasal passage. Okay. Let's move on. So I'm going to take just a little breath. Um, so that was a quick review of the parts of the palate, um, how they they move, how they work, how they're supposed, supposed to work, and, um, um, and for what reason, for feeding and, and, and speech primarily. So now let's think back, let's bring the conversation back to the cleft lip and palate situation. Um, a few more questions in case you have.
had them and um, are thinking of them, Less Within Palette um, occurs across ethnicity and uh, in boys and girls, females and males. Um, Less Within Palette um, has a slightly increased incidence in the Asian um, descent. Um, and Less Within Palette, Less Within Palette, Less Within Palette occurs twice as frequently in males as it does in females. And um, it occurs uh, twice as, and subpalate only occurs twice as frequently in females uh, as it does in males. And so moving on, the causes are multifactorial, both combination of environmental and uh, genetic um, factors. So now we're thinking about our children with suffering and palate. What's the treatment? What's the intervention? Uh, what do we do in EI and just serve them? Is it one intervention, more than one, and when does that begin? So I'm sure that we are all thinking, uh, first thing comes to mind, surgery, of course. You need to close the gap, uh, repair that anatomy, uh, make it whole again. The goals of surgery are also um, to make sure that there's restored a, a length of the palate as well as good mobility, and that surgery is time to maximize the growth of the upper jaw, um, facial growth, and also really important to optimize readiness for speech uh, production. So um, let's do a poll again. When do you think surgery for cleft lip uh, it is takes place? So again, you can use your pointer tool. Um, to mark off when you think that surgery to the lip will take place. Great, Kyla. It looks like people were just asking about the lip for the first time, for the first poll. Okay. And um, none of you said that you were on uh, work on such teams, but I think we could, uh, I could start recruiting uh, here. Uh, the cleft lip. Uh, uh, definitely um, is uh, takes place at age three months. So we'll we'll clear the screen and now put in your guess um, for when the cleft of the secondary palate takes place. Um, let let me answer that and move move along a little bit. Um, uh, optimally, the, the surgery should be at the nine to twelve month um, uh, age age level. Sometimes that takes the surgery is um, um, a little bit later, uh, but we'd really like it to be in that nine to ten month to twelve month age level again to optimize the uh, production. Um, readiness for speech. And, um, you know, combined management is what we need. We need the surgery, but you're thinking, well, see, that baby can't wait for three months for a repair of the lip and certainly not nine months before they can start eating. No, they can't. We need um, to put in some external support uh, and intervene. Um, and just like uh, for speech readiness, um, babies are starting to babble um, a little bit around uh, six months. Their babble gets stronger by nine months with, with a lot more uh, stronger sounds that are starting to sound like consonants that they need to explore that palate and that airflow and produce those sounds um, and then use those sounds more frequently and for first words. Um, so um, we need that surgery. To, to be uh, in, in place for when the kids are ready to uh, produce um, their feet and, and go with their feet. And we sometimes might need to monitor that or provide some direct um, intervention. So let's look at uh, some of what we can do, starting with um, the feeding. Babies who have slept with a pellet can be and are successful feeders. feeders and they do that um, by use of um, 
specialty nipples and bottles um, that the the, the um, feeder, the caregiver, um, supports the lack of compression and the lack of suction um, that the baby doesn't have with the plus of the, the secondary palate. The, this is just one type of uh, specialty bottle. Um, it's called Averman. It's the Medella product. There are several products that are either assistive a device, a delivery um, through the bottle or through the nipple and some use of a one-way valve that allows the flow of, of the liquid to the baby. And then the baby thinks they're, they're sucking um, reflex um, with that delivery of the milk. Um, positioning is important uh, to help reduce the um, uh, nasal regurgitation, so upright positioning. And we always want to use the infant director in cubate feeding for most efficient feeding, uh, most pleasurable uh, feeding uh, that the baby gets just the right amount in the right amount of time and with the least amount of stress. We're touching only on the feeding solutions here. There's a lot more information at the, um, the American Plus Health Association website and the children. Seattle Children's Hospital has a, has a very nice explanation um, of these um, assisted delivery devices and how to feed your baby. Um, so I'm just going to move on a little bit so I don't, so I can answer your questions uh, and not leave out any information. Um, we also want to have um, combined management for um, best speech outcomes. Surgery is done as early as a appropriate for that child. There may be some uh, factors um, that delay on the, the surgery for the children, maybe um, the medical status of that child. Um, so it's early as appropriate for that child. And then we want that, that child to start practicing using that mechanism. We really won't know how well surgery um, is working or how well it is working until we hear the output in the speech production, in those consonants like we practice um, that require uh, the palatal closure. So first consonants babies are exploring, um, they need to be reinforced for the sounds they're making um, from their own mechanism, from externally, from uh, auditory input from everybody around them and then build those sounds into their first word vocabulary. Um, and again, if we either need monitoring or direct services, um, speech develops over time and um, we're going to be listening for what's happening and, and, and how that baby is responding to their own developmental profile. So, um, that brings us to team care. We know about EI team care. We have multiple um, providers, um, um, multidisciplinary um, primary providers, and we team within. And I'd like us to encourage, and so as a fellow guy, encourage um, all of us to join his team. And he has other teams in place too, and that's the class, uh, palette team. Um, that provides a lot of his medical and surgery. It's a specialized um, services from multi, um, multiple specialists working on an integrated team as well. Um, and if you are not familiar with um, the, the teams in Virginia, there are at least five teams. Uh, there, there, there are more, but these are the listings that you can find um, in the Subpalate Association under Find a Team, and they're on their approved teams because they've gone through these teams have gone through scrutiny um, and um, um, uh, standardized. Um, uh, there are standards of care that they follow. Uh, so those sunny spots are in Charlottesville, Falls Church, Norfolk, Portsmouth, and Richmond. I hope some of you know of these areas, and if you know of other teams, um, please give me a shout out in chat to let me know uh, where and us know where those other teams are. And there may be there are other teams. There's a team in, in Roanoke. I'm not. I don't know that that's on that list, but um, 
bona fide team um, also. And you can see that there's a paucity of teams in the Southwest Virginia. But these families um, may go to other states for their team care. Um, those uh, teams might be closer to them. They may have personal preference for using that team because that's maybe where the child was born. Maybe that's where they started out or there's some other specialized service uh, in the facility where that team also is. Um, what else can I tell you um, about this? Um, we well, I think we will have some time for questions. Um, and let me know what your needs are, what you'd like to hear more about, the feeding and feed concerns, maybe how um, um, the children, how children who have cliff compare to children without cliff, how we can manage better in um, the EI team, and how we can link um, with. Um, the the cleft team, you know, um, instead of us just handing off our kids after they age out at three, hopefully we will have been working hand in hand um, with um, the team and support the families to continue with their team care. These kids will have some procedures that take them through their adolescence years and definitely need support. Um, as we've identified earlier, um, for social emotional support, there are psychologists on the team, geneticists, dentists. Um, there are a lot of people who um, provide the community care um, and, and connect with the public team. So, just a few minutes for, for questions. I'm going to let Dana um, kind of direct things from here. All right, Colette, thanks. We do have a couple of questions that popped up in chat over the course of our time, and we only have about three minutes left. Um, two, some of them I think we're going to address next time. I do want to say, um, like Lynn has written, what does the hospital team need from the EI team? So Lynn, we'll cover that next time when we talk about EI, we talk about team care. So hang out for that one. We had another um, question about what types of services are best. I think, again, we'll get into that next time. Generally, you know how early intervention is so individualized, that's a big part of that discussion. But we're going to talk about interventions a little more next time. Colette, we did have a question about um, if there were any environmental risk factors to keep in mind for children who have cleft lip or palate. Um, and we, so right kind of along with that, there was a question about pain and discomfort associated with cleft lip and cleft palate. So I don't know if those go hand in hand or if you want to answer those separately. Um, so, well, the environmental risk would be prenatally. Um, remember, there, it would be um, uh, the exposure of, of the mother. Um, I think that's what your question might be asking. Um, so there are some um, medicines um, that have connection. Um, seizure medications, I think some medications for diabetes. Um, uh, Vitamin deficiency that can be linked to increased incidence of clefting, um, exposure, of course, to uh, drugs, alcohol, and smoking, if that answers your question. Um, yes, Ms. Colette, I think that's probably, that. I hope that hits on what she was wanting. If not, I can't remember who typed that in. Okay, good. Lynn says it does. Um, I wanted to acknowledge we do have a question from Fairfax. How do we encourage typical sound development? In Fairfax, we're going to get into more about feeding and speech next time. So hang in there. Um, that's coming. Did you, would you have time with our last minute or two to answer uh, the question about are there, is there any pain and discomfort for infants and toddlers with cleft lips and cleft palate? Do we know? Um, um, do we know? Um, it's not that, no, I don't think so. Um, but are you maybe talking about with surgery, the pain and discomfort at the time of surgery and maybe then after? Well, I think it sounds like not with surgery, more just day to day with having those openings. I mean, is there typically oh, 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 pain oh, oh. or is it the way that that's the only thing the children know? No. So. Yeah, not, not necessarily. Sometimes with feeding, you know, um, until the, uh, after the secondary palate is repaired, some food. Um, can go up into that nasal area. Um, 
It's not, it's not pain, and food typically doesn't get caught up there. It usually is coming out uh, through the nose, so it, it works its way out. Um, so I'll think about that, too. Okay. That sounds good. So um, there's one last question. So if the mother and father don't carry the, you know, the genetic factors, environmental factors can cause cleft lip and cleft palate. And I think that's what you were saying. There are some other risk factors with the medication and things like that. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, so if the mother and father doesn't carry the gene, it can be environmental, and it could be not environmental, and it could just be a, a brand new occurrence genetically. It, um, you know, it, 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 it's a first-time occurrence. Also. Okay. All right, guys. Well, I have written down the other questions that relate to what we'll talk about next time, so I'll send those to Colette, and we'll be sure to try to address those next time. It's 1 o'clock, so I want to wrap us up. First, I want to thank Colette. You did a beautiful job today, Colette. As people have written in chat, great information, lots of good information. So I hope everybody will join us for next time. Part 2 is on March 5th. At, from noon to 1. After your, the webinar closes today, you'll receive a link to a survey by email. We hope you'll take the time to give us that feedback in the survey. Once you complete the survey, you'll have access to your certificate of participation for an hour of professional development today. We also would love for you to let others know that this webinar will be archived on the VEIPD.org site on our Professional Development Center site. So that will be located there within the next couple days or so. Um, so they can, if they want to catch up, watch the archived version and join us next time. So if you have any questions, you're, you can reach out to Colette. You're welcome to email me. Um, you guys can find my email address on our website as well. Um, and then if you, you know, we'd love to hear from you any feedback between now and then. So otherwise, I'm going to wrap us up. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks again, Colette. Thank you, Dana and Jeannie, my coaches, and you took me out of my comfort zone. Thank you so much. Beautiful job today. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.